Hi everyone, so today we're diving into a bit more detail on um, <coughs> some of the techniques that we as archaeologists use before we even put a spade in the ground. So this session is going to be focused on some remote sensing uh, and geographic information systems or GIS and how we use them and those techniques to help uh, us find out where to dig. So what is remote sensing? Some of you guys will have seen this slide before from the previous talk, um, but basically by using a combination of satellite imagery, uh, plane-based sensors, geophysics machines, historic mapping, uh, we can build up a, a picture of the um, topography and underlying geology that can indicate to us areas where archeological remains are likely to survive. And then we can gather all of these different types of data together and create a digital map of the landscape and in this case the battlefield on which we can hang all of our other uh, data. And the key to all this lies in the use of what's known as a geographic information system or a GIS. It's sometimes you'll see it referred to also as geographic information science um, but I prefer the the system part of it as it shows that we can use this technology as a tool as a, as a system to bring together very disparate data sources. Uh, so you can you can see this in action here. Um, so we're going from the scale of the aerial photographs down zooming into a higher resolution drone image of the courtyard. You can see how much higher resolution that is uh, of the courtyard at Hougamon. And then we go right down to a digitized paper drawing of the trench that's been scanned in and put on top of that map, which shows every little, basically every little brick or rock that we, that we excavated. And you'll notice at the bottom of the screen here that um, we have accurate coordinates for everything as well. So each element of the data is what's known as geo-referenced. So we have a, we have a um, it's tied into its spatial location. And this is really the key here. Everything has a spatial location from the place where we found the tiniest musket ball to the whole battlefield of Waterloo itself. And we can tie everything together, lay everything on top of each other by their spatial location. And then we can query them all together using the GIS. But how do we get from here, a 3D sphere, all the way down to here? A flat map that we can plot things on. So we're going all the way from space all the way down to an aerial photograph there of, of Hougamon Farm. Now map, mapping a sphere to a flat plane is a very very complex business and this is where we have to get to grips with something called a map projection. Okay, Some of you may have come across this before but I'll do a quick uh, demonstration using an orange. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to use this orange uh, here to demonstrate what is actually sometimes called the orange peel problem. So you can see I've drawn a bad representation of the world's continents on the outside of this orange. And the orange peel problem really asks this question. How do you map something that's spherical onto a flat plane so that we can get these nice neat square grid lines and, and useful coordinates? So bear with me here, I'm just pulling off this bit of orange peel. It takes a takes a little time and I appear to be also rubbing off the world. I should have used a better marker pen whilst drawing that on. But anyway, we'll get there. So we're essentially peeling off the, the surface of the earth here. Um, and I suspect once the orange is out, I will have that later um, for lunch. But anyway, we're almost there. So as you'll see, once that orange peel is off, there we go. Great. Once that orange peels off, firstly, it's in a funny shape, right? Because I completely massacred that when I when I um, when I peeled it. Um, but secondly, and most importantly, it's actually very difficult to get that orange peel to lie flat. There's always bits sticking up. Um, even when I've massacred it like this to try and make it lie flat, you see, I've sort of pulled it in different ways, but it's still never going to lie flat onto the ground. So one of the ways that we solve this is to cut this peel into smaller pieces so they can either be rectangular or square and then you can lie each one of those down flat and you don't get that distortion of your coordinates or of in our case the land surface here because that orange peel is flat and it's in a small area and that small area 
we can much more easily um, deal with basically rather than having to draw a map of the whole world we can just draw a map on that small piece of orange peel there and it's this cutting of the earth peel into smaller areas and then putting them back together again that, that gives us what's shown here is the UTM system the universal transverse Mercator system um, but it also gives us the national grids of places like the UK and Belgium um, so you can see here, if we've got those two little pieces of, of uh, orange peel, we can easily draw the outlines badly of Belgium and of the UK on them without any stretching or funny distortion. And that means then we can map them with very straight lines and get our nice X, Y, easy to deal with coordinates as we do. Now, map projections as a whole is, I could talk for hours on map projections and they're pretty mind bending, but they are a vital part of understanding all sorts of aspects of this battle from from how we deal with the uh, GPS plots from of the metal detected finds, which obviously is taking its information directly from satellites, um, even back to the analyzing the cartography used by both Napoleon and Wellington when they were planning their, their um, battle strategies. So let's talk a little bit about these early maps. So we can first start here once we start putting all of this data together we can first start with a map um, of the area which was surveyed pre-1815 and uh, 1777 um, you can see a rough area of the of the battlefield there outlined in red um, but because we have these maps properly geolocated we can start kind of playing around with them fading them out and then comparing them with the modern situation now, if we zoom in a little bit here into Hougoumont. Now here, zooming in, overlaid on top, you can see this famous map by de Cran, which was drawn just after the battle. And it shows the area as it was at the time. Um, and here you can clearly see the formal gardens of Hougoumont. There's the buildings of Hougoumont here and the forest, which obviously, if you know anything about the Battle of Hougoumont, which you guys have probably heard about now, you know, this, these areas are very, very important in terms of the defense of, and attack of, of Hougoumont. Um, but the other nice thing about this de Cran map is that you can also see the um, disposition of the troops uh, as it started. Now we can start playing around with this if we want to. So you can take this troop data from de Cran's map and then using various other sources of troop movements throughout the day, you can start spatially mapping these within the GIS and produce a sort of temporal map of how the battle for Hougoumont happened. So if it, once it resets, you can see at the bottom, the French come up and then there's a lot of fighting through the woods. They get, they get there for a while um, and then eventually they get pushed back by the, by the reinforcements coming, by the allied reinforcements coming back off the line. And at the end of the day, they, they run away. So this is a good example of how um, of how we can use all sorts of different types of data and start visualizing them in a different way on top of on top of our historic maps but also you know within our GIS using data from all sorts of different sources so that was you know historic maps so now we can start looking at some of the other aspects of remote sensing that I just briefly want to touch on here and each one of these has vast amounts of literature vast amounts of other information about it and I thoroughly encourage anyone who's interested to, to really delve deep because there's some pretty cool stuff that you can do here and that we can look at. But let's start comparing and combining some of these different spatial data sources and, and try and use them to complement each other. So for instance, let's take the formal garden of Hougoumont again. Um, so in this case, we can look at uh, a historic map. This one was created by um, Cyborn. Uh, and it shows the garden as he suggested it was laid out. He wasn't actually there in the battle. He surveyed the battlefield a little bit later um, afterwards. Um, <clears throat> but this is his, his speculation on what the, what the garden would have looked like at the time. So historic map there. But now we can start turning towards some slightly more complex technologies. Uh, and we can begin to analyze both the above and below ground topography to see what it can reveal about possible archaeological remains still underneath the ground there. Now, one way we've done that in the past at Waterloo is to utilize a, um, a suite of geophysical techniques. So I'm not 
going to have time to go into the ins and deep into the ins and outs of these but the essential premise is that by measuring both the electrical resistance and also the magnetic susceptibility of the soil itself we can use these to look for different buried deposits so certain features that are buried such as walls or large stones will produce a certain result that can be measured um, <clears throat> has a different reaction electricity passes through it a different way or it has a different reaction to um, to magnetism um, and this is also true for soil that's been disturbed in the past so for instance by the digging of a pit or areas of burning so soil that's been messed about with in the past um, will have a different magnetic signature as will it as it will if it's been burnt as well um, it really affects the magnetism of the soil so by using you know an example here is dragged behind a quad bike but you may also have seen them um, as machines that you can walk along with as well. Uh, by using those, we can produce a plot of these particular signals from the ground. And in this case, you can see the geophysics plot overlaid on the top of uh, an aerial photograph of Hougamon. And you can see very clearly here the lines of the uh, walled garden, right in the right place that it should be in, and actually in a pretty good. Um, a pretty good configuration according to some of the historic maps as well. And again, because this is all georeferenced, here we go, we should be able to just fade in the historic map and you see how well they how well they match up there. Not too bad. So as if that you know that wasn't convincing enough, we can also look at micro topography. Um, <clears throat> now this is a utilizing a type of data called LIDAR, which is um, light detection and ranging. Uh, essentially you fly a survey device on a plane over the area and that survey device shoots millions of lasers that hit the ground and then reflect back. The equipment on the plane calculates the time it takes for the laser to bounce back to the plane. Bomp, how long does it take to come back up again? And by doing that it's possible for it to create a very, very, very accurate um, elevation model, a model of the topography. So much so that we can just see the slight undulations of the previous garden in today's ground service, and I'll show you that right now. So here's a result of um, the LIDAR. So again, here we are looking at the walled garden and those planting walls there, they're very clear to see in here. Um, and they match up extremely well with both the geophysics and the historic mapping. Um, <coughs> what's interesting about this is that when we actually excavated these particular planting walls, we didn't find anything at all in the ground. There was no visible trace of these. So the only traces we have are these tiny little micro undulations on the ground and also the magnetic and electrical um, signals that were coming from the geophysics. Um, if we'd have had none of that data and just dug a hole there, we would have said, oh no, there wasn't any garden planting at all. Um, so this is really interesting. This is proper remote sensing. It, to the extreme, basically. Uh, as another aside here, because LIDAR works by shooting lasers from the air, some of those lasers, when they come down, will hit the tree canopy and then bounce back up. And then some of them will go through the tree canopy and hit the ground. So using some fancy algorithms, it's possible to extrapolate out the difference between the lasers that hit the ground surface and the lasers that hit the trees, uh, which is effectively means you can turn the trees off and see through the canopy. Now this has been completely revolutionary for, um, for uh, remote sensing archaeology in all over the world, but especially in places like the UK where there's a lot of forest and a lot of field systems, etc., hidden within the forests of, of the UK. Um, and now we're suddenly able to fly a plane over with the LIDAR, turn the trees off and see through the trees and see what the ground's like, which is impossible to survey, you know, if you were going in there with a GPS or a total station within the, or traditional surveying equipment within the trees. It's very, very difficult to do, but suddenly we can just do it from space, uh, from a plane, which is, it's amazing. And uh, if you look here, you can see these two, um, two uh, rings here. So as you can imagine, when we first looked at this around Hougamon, we were extremely excited when we saw this area of uh, what looks like ring ditches um, in the woods north of the farm. And 
we actually thought, oh my God, we've uncovered not just the remains of the battlefield of Waterloo, but also a hitherto unknown prehistoric camp um, or settlement. And this is, you know, this is a good reminder that while we're looking for the battlefield of Waterloo, we can also, you know, this is a palimpsest landscape. There's been people living here for thousands and thousands of years. So we're looking for the remains from the battle, but of course we do come across remains from all periods as well. But back to this, it turns out that when we went on the ground to visit this particular uh, area of woodland north of Hougamont to try and find our amazing prehistoric camp, it was actually a dirt bike track used by the local youth. Um, so not archaeological at all yet. Uh, and so the lesson from that really, of that slight disappointment, um, is that no matter how cool some of this remote sensing is, no matter how amazing it looks, you always need to go out on the ground and test those results. It's called ground truthing. You need to go out and just make sure what the computer is telling you is actually what it's like on the ground. And that's that's super, super important. So that's it. That was a very whistle-stop tour of some of the remote sensing techniques we use in archaeology as a whole and also at Waterloo. And... Um, I hope the, the sort of takeaway you get from this is that it's it's um, extremely important for us to be able to pull all of this stuff together, to be able to display, to be able to visualise and use all of these different data strands uh, linked by spatial location, because by just pulling one in or another in, you might get a different story, but by using all of these different strands together, putting them all in one place, laying them all on top of each other like a big sandwich, you suddenly get a much, much fuller picture and I'll see you in the next session. Thanks very much.